Hello class, uh, I'm back. This is lecture number 28 for History 102. And we left off with the bombing of Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941. FDR will immediately go to Congress. Uh, it'll be the day that lives in infamy and the uh, U.S. Congress will quickly respond with the declaration of war on the Axis powers, which is Germany, Italy, and Japan. So we'll join what's left of the Allies, mainly England, uh, in World War II. Now, uh, FDR had his work cut out for him, even though he had been, been preparing quite well to enter this war with the military buildup and the peacetime draft. But Americans, after this attack on Pearl Harbor, wanted immediate revenge against the Japanese. And he had to convince Americans uh, in general that we needed to adopt the so-called get Hitler first strategy, that Hitler was the biggest threat to democracy in the world, and he had to be defeated first, and then we could turn all of our attention to the Japanese. Now, obviously, this was also the strategy that his uh, War Department wanted, and FDR was the one who had to sell it to the American public. But remember, he's becoming very good at this by now. He's been utilizing throughout the Great Depression, New Deal, and through World War II, his famous fireside chats where he explains policy to Americans. So they're very accustomed to listening to his rationale. So uh, unlike World War I, though, there's no significant speak of anti-war movement whatsoever. When we're attacked by the Japanese, that's it. So Unfortunately, though, this, uh, you know, wanting of revenge against Japan takes a different form, and that's what happens to Japanese Americans during World War II. You have a uh, Makers of American section in your book on pages 794, 795, and this is when Japanese Americans... Uh, are placed in internment camps here in the United States. Now, first of all, let me premise this by pointing out we were also at war with Germany and Italy. Germans and Italians were not rounded up and placed in camps uh, because we believed they were a threat to us. <clears throat> this was racially motivated against the Japanese, and a lot of it had to do with a horrible legacy of Asian racism <clears throat> in the state of California. Now, one prime example of this is, take a look at that photograph on page 794 of this, what appears to be middle-class woman standing in front of her house in California, pointing to these two signs in her yard that are unbelievable. This is mainstream America in California during this time. <clears throat> so what's going to happen here is FDR will issue executive order number <clears throat> 9066, which calls for 110,000 Japanese to be rounded up and placed in internment camps, most of them along the West Coast of the United States. <clears throat> now, two-thirds of this 110,000 Japanese people were Japanese Americans who were born here. They were U.S. citizens. <clears throat> now, this order comes out. Japanese are informed by mail that they have to a certain time to report to train stations across the West Coast, 
where they'll be transported to these internment camps, <clears throat> which critics refer to as concentration camps because they were concentrating people there based on their race, like the Germans did, but obviously not with the intent to torture and murder them like the Germans did. <clears throat> so, uh, these people were placed, you know, had to sell all their belongings because they never knew when they're going to get out of these camps. A lot of them lost their homes because they couldn't pay their mortgages while they're in a camp. And <clears throat> they report and they're transported to these internment camps. You can see the young boys behind the barbed wire. You can see uh, evacuees being rounded up and taken, searched, and so forth on page 795. <laughs> Now, this act is challenged in the United States Supreme Court, and the famous case that comes in front of the court in 1944 is Korematsu versus the United States. And let me tell you a little bit about this case. Uh, the person who challenges this is a Japanese-American, he was born in this country. Uh, and in fact, to give you an idea of this, his name is Fred Korematsu. And he and his attorneys are basically arguing, <clears throat> what the hell happened to my Bill of Rights? I'm a U.S. citizen. How can I be taken like this, imprisoned, and I haven't done anything? He thought he was as American as apple pie, and he was outraged by this. Now, the Supreme Court basically says, if the United States government, during a time of a declared war, where the government takes on extraordinary powers, <clears throat> wants to take this group of people, the Japanese, and place them in these holding camps as a matter of national security because the argument was they might be tempted to sabotage things or if the Japanese did actually invade the West Coast, help their comrades, which I highly doubt, <clears throat> that the government could do that because it was a hardship of war, as they said. And they went on to say a lot of hardships of war exist during this horrible war. 15 million American men are in the military all around the world now, and some are going to make the ultimate sacrifice. So this is a sacrifice we're asking these people to make in the war effort. So it's perfectly constitutional. Now, uh, Practically all Japanese Americans lived west of the Mississippi. That's just the way they migrated. And uh, there were a couple of ways to be released from these internment camps. <clears throat> One was if you could secure employment uh, east of the Mississippi River, namely along the East Coast. If you could get a job there and it was written, written down and the, the employer agreed to bring you there, then you were, I guess, supposedly not going to be a threat because the Japanese would never invade the Atlantic coast. <clears throat> the other way to get out of the camp, that way not many people took advantage of because it was almost impossible, was if you joined the United States military, you could be released from the camp. Now, 13,000 very brave Japanese men did that. They joined the military and fought very bravely for the United States, which really kind of makes you scratch your head. They're fighting to defend a constitution that doesn't apply to them. <clears throat> but you can even see the embedded racism here. All of these men could only fight in the European theater of war. None were allowed in the Asian battlefields because they were afraid they'd be traitors. Now, one of the groups that I did some research on in graduate school when I was doing an oral history project 
with some World War II veterans at a, a veterans hospital in Ann Arbor, uh, were, were the Japanese 422nd Combat Team. This team of all Japanese were some of the most highly decorated in the entire European theater. Uh, this team suffered over 500 casualties and were given more than a thousand citations for bravery. These guys fought like no one else. And I was talking to these two World War II veterans who were both involved in the Battle of the Bulge. <clears throat> and they both said that the turning turning the tide factor in that very famous battle that allowed the Allies to emerge victorious was when they called in <clears throat> the 442nd Combat Team and they fought so bravely, they turned the tide of that entire battle. And both of these gentlemen remember this and fighting side by side with these very brave men. Now, <clears throat> these camps being highly controversial, to add insult to injury, the Japanese will not all be released from the internment camps until March of 1946. World War II will end in September 1945. The war with Germany will end in April of 1945. And these people were still held in these camps all the way to March of 1946 for no explainable reason. Now, obviously this was horrible. In 1988, during the Reagan administration, Congress passed a law officially apologizing for government actions during this period and setting up reparations for these survivors to the tune of $12 billion. <clears throat> there were 60,000 survivors that still lived in 1988 from these internment camps, and each one of them was awarded $20,000. Now, I can remember when this happened, and some people were screaming bloody murder. What are we doing giving these people $20,000 apiece? That was a drop in the bucket. If you were a Japanese family and you lost everything in 1942, including your house, your business in California, what's $20,000 in 1988? It wouldn't buy a storage shed in San Francisco. <clears throat> so a little bit, a little too late, but it's better than nothing. So now we want to get onto the uh, so-called war machine that the country puts together. Now that we can jump into this full-fledged, war orders by the United States government in 1942, the first full year of the war, totaled $100 billion worth of materials. To give you an idea of what this meant, <clears throat> the gross national product of the United States, our total output in 1940 was $100 billion. In 1942, the military orders $100 billion worth of items. Now, uh, by 1945, the gross national product of the United States had doubled to $200 billion. Now, Part of the reason why I mention this, as soon as we enter World War II in 1942, the Great Depression is a thing of the past. It's distant memory. We're completely out of it. We have full employment. We're going to have 15 million men in the military, not to mention every able-bodied person working in factories in America to produce the materials of war. This is what pulled us out of the Depression. <clears throat> and I mention that because there's still arguments over, would have the New Deal ultimately pulled us completely out of the Great Depression? Well, we'll never know. World War II happened. That's what did it, and we never looked back. So, just like what we covered 
during World War I with some of these government agencies created for the war effort, I want to mention a few of the important ones. One was the War Production Board. Now, one thing we got to realize, our uh, involvement in World War I was pretty short-lived compared to World War II. I mean, we entered it in 1917. It's over with by November of 1918 and it took us a while to even get to Europe. And remember the volume, 3 million men in the military versus 15 million. So, uh, also the war effort is going to be much more magnified. The War Productions Board, uh, through executive orders by FDR, ended the manufacture of all non-essential items, like automobiles and nylon stockings. The big three automakers in America all shifted their production to Jeeps, tanks, and other military items under government order and gladly did so because the government guaranteed they would buy every single item they made. This is what a lot of people are urging President Trump to do now, which he could if he wanted to, but has been reluctant for some reason. <clears throat> now, you might say, why are they limiting the production of nylon stockings? Nylon was a brand new material that had just recently been developed and all the nylon we produced, which was in limited supplies, needed to be used for parachutes. So, those are two examples. Also, uh, one thing that the War Production Board was end up putting in charge of and did a miraculous job of, all of a sudden we're faced with a shortage of rubber because all the rubber plantations were in Asia and the Japanese controlled them all. So they cut us off from the world's rubber supplies. Back at the beginning of the war, that's what tires were made of. They're all made out of real rubber. <clears throat> so very quickly, we're running out of rubber for the tires we need for our military vehicles, let alone the automobiles in the United States. <clears throat> so the War Production Board is going to get a gigantic team of scientists, similar to what we're doing today, trying to come up with a vaccine for COVID-19. But these scientists, were their task was come up with a synthetic form of rubber to replace rubber in tires. It's of national emergency. So pretty quickly, within six months, they come up with the compounds needed. And then the government goes even a step further and constructs 51 plants to manufacture the synthetic Sonic materials, and the tires needed for the war effort. We can do it if we want to. Now, uh, also related to that, <clears throat> there was, uh, you know, an energy bo war board, just like before, and uh, we're obviously going to reinstitute daylight savings time to save energy, but this is also going to be the first time that we actually ration gasoline uh, to save it for the war effort. Uh, they certainly, this will restrict uh, joyriding in cars because you only uh, were rationed so many gallons per week. <clears throat> and you had ration books. Some of you may have seen them before. And they instituted a nationwide speed limit at, 50 because not because it saved gasoline like the old 55 mile an hour speed limit of the 70s it saved on the wear of tires if you went faster than 50 in a vehicle your tires wore out quickly so they're more concerned about saving tires and it's why they instituted it <clears throat> there was also uh food rationing during world war ii 
and Victory Gardens are reborn once again and are very successful. <clears throat> There's an Office of Price Administration. They're the ones who are going to handle the rationing of everything from meat to gasoline. And they're going to put on strict price controls of items because one thing that can happen during a war is inflation. So they're going to keep the prices fixed to stop inflation during the war. Then there's also going to be a war labor board, which will put caps on wage increases because believe it or not, corporate America was trying to pay people more to lure them into work to produce the things that the United States government was guaranteeing they would buy. And also, the smith Connolly Anti-Strike Act was passed of 1943, which during wartime suspended the ability of labor unions to go on strike. Now, another factor that we need to talk about, obviously, with the war effort, and I think we have the, there. there's some uh, photo, or some posters right there on the next page, 796. She's a wow, a woman's ordinance worker, uh, and other, uh, you know, promotional posters like Rosie the Riveter, to get women, many, to leave the house for the first time and take jobs that uh, traditionally were the jobs of men, like building tanks or ships and so forth, like Rosie the Riveter. <clears throat> so, uh, six million women will enter the workforce during World War II. 50% of them had never worked outside the house before but they had to be recruited and convinced they could do these kind of jobs. And by the way, I also want to mention that 216,000 women entered the military in different services, all strictly in non-combat roles, or so to speak, they were. And back in this day and age, each branch of the military had their own wing for women, which obviously don't exist today. Like if you were in the Navy and you were a female, you were a wave. In the Army, you were a whack and so forth. <clears throat> now, one group of women who will finally be decorated uh, by uh, President Clinton and uh, recognized for their bravery were women in the Air Force. These women, many of them, were trained to be pilots, not to go into combat, but to be test pilots for uh, the United States Air Force and their revolutionary new aircraft they were testing out in bases in California and Texas. <clears throat> A lot of these women lost their lives in fiery crashes of these experimental aircraft. These women were never recognized for this, and women didn't get the same benefits after the war that men did because they were considered to be non-combat. <clears throat> but these were women who actually lost their lives, not in combat, but just as brave. These women fought for years to be recognized. And finally, late in the Clinton administration, they were all awarded medals, and full benefits that were due to them by the United States Veterans Association. <clears throat> I met a couple of these women at another World War II conference I went to at Siena College, and it was quite the privilege to meet and talk to these women and hear what they went through, not only during their test flights, but just to be recognized by the United States government. Now, uh, also what we want to talk about with the women like Rosie the Riveter and the WOW women, women ordinance workers, one thing that made all of this possible was the United States government during World War II entered into the daycare business because a lot of women said, hey, I'd love to help the war effort. I'd love to go build a ship like Rosie the Riveter, 
but what am I supposed to do with my kids? I have to take care of them. So the United States government constructed 3,000 government-operated daycare centers to solve this problem. And they worked tremendously. Unfortunately, when the war ended, they closed them all. That's one of the biggest problems we have today in our society is finding decent daycare for your children so both couples can work. Why we close those? The federal government needs to re-enter the daycare business. We did it before. We can do it again. So uh, the uh, other thing that I want to talk about as far as uh, different groups working <clears throat> I want to talk about the Fair Employment Practices Commission because what's going to happen here during the war is there's going to be a massive migration of African Americans from the South to Northern factories like in the Detroit area working in the big three auto industries. They were encouraged to do that by the United States government. But unfortunately, when they moved to the North, many of them were met with racism and there were race riots in Northern cities aimed at these brand new African-American neighbors that they had who were working in the factories just like them. <clears throat> the person who was in uh, the leader of the NAACP at this point is a gentleman by the name of A. Philip Randolph who met routinely with FDR talking about these issues of racism and what's going on here. The government encourages his people to move north and then they're met with this nonsense. FDR will create the Fair Employment Practices Commission to make sure these 1.6 million African-Americans who moved were treated fairly. And they even come up with a campaign led by A. Philip Randolph known as the Double V Campaign. During World War II, it was very routinely for average American citizens to give this sign to each other. It meant V for victory, not like during Vietnam and forward where it meant peace. <clears throat> the Double V Campaign, people would flash each other two Vs. One V for victory over fascism, the other V for victory over racism. The double V campaign. So, final thing I want to talk about today is the election of 1944. Now, FDR is going to, this time, break something that's not even a tradition, he's going to run for a completely unprecedented fourth term. Now, this time, he obviously argues, <clears throat> we're smack dab in the middle of this horrible war. I'm working very closely with Winston Churchill. It's no time for a change. And in this particular campaign, uh, he will be challenged by... Uh, the highly popular governor of New York State, Republican Thomas Dewey. And in this election, FDR, it'll be closer. Obviously, there's, you know, a lot of people didn't want three terms. Some people are going four terms. What's going on here? Is he going to be a king or what? <clears throat> so in this election, FDR will uh, receive about 25 and a half million votes. Dewey will receive 22, so it's his closest victory. <clears throat> and really, the biggest thing that will happen in this election is uh, his former vice president, Henry Wallace, will decide to call it quits, and FDR will pick a brand new, unknown vice president, Harry S. Truman. Now, that'll become a very important decision because... FDR sworn in for his fourth term in, on January 20th, 1945. 
FDR will pass away on April 12th, 1945. Just four months into his presidency, less than that. That will make Harry S. Truman president of the United States on April 12th, 1945. World War II will be his to finish out. So that's where I'm going to call it quits for the day. When I come back again to lecture to you next time, we're going to finish up World War II and we'll be entering into the late 40s and early 1950s. <clears throat> so I'll see you soon. Take care. Everybody be safe. Bye now.